we are recording right now. So, well, it's time. Wits and greetings to you all, dear friends who are participating in this on your different screens, wherever you are. Whitson greetings. I would like to begin with this greeting for Whitson. In London at the moment, we have a remarkable exhibition of works by Raphael, and it's really quite an extraordinary exhibition. There are only over a hundred items in the exhibition, and they come from all over the world. Uh, some are already anyway in England, many from Italy, from America, and also from um, private collections around the world. So indeed, it's a, very, it's a very great occasion. And I simply wanted to begin by mentioning this fact because Raphael is the, is the artist whose work we will look at this evening. For me, it's evening. And this is the first picture in the exhibition. It's a drawing that he made, self-portrait that he made when he was uh, very young. It's not dated, but um, we assume he did this when he was, uh, yeah, still maybe a, a young teenager. There is a more well-known portrait, self-portrait, which is in, in Oxford. And already you see a, a considerable difference in the way in which he sees himself and the way in which he presents himself. And in the exhibition in London, there's also this self-portrait that is normally in, in the Uffizi in, in Florence. And I've become very interested in autobiographies and in self-portraits. Um, these are opportunities for the painter or the writer to make objective for themselves something of what they carry within themselves. So if you write your autobiography, you are not just observing yourself, but you're making it visible to yourself and to the rest of the world. And you have a chance to observe how you have portrayed yourself. And the same thing is true then for a self-portrait. If you paint a portrait of someone who is sitting opposite you, it's clear that the left side of the of the person being painted appears on the right side of the canvas. But if you're painting a self-portrait with a mirror, then the left side really is on the left. So in this self-portrait, Raphael offers us predominantly his right side. And in this later painting, he offers us predominantly his left side. And I find that interesting, and I also find it very revealing. There's a degree of certainty of who I am in this. I have the feeling that in this portrait, there's more of a question. Maybe not so much, who am I, but more, who do you see when you look at me? Who am I for you? Many of you will know that when Rudolf Steiner felt it was the appropriate moment to describe a sequence of incarnations in, in his um, opening up the whole, the whole realm of reincarnation, one of the first sequences that he spoke about publicly was actually the sequence that involves Raphael himself. And he describes the sequence of incarnations from Elijah to John the Baptist to Raphael and then to Novalis, Friedrich von Hardenberg. And this is an early painting in which Raphael paints John the Baptist in this attitude of devotion to the mother and child. Quite a contrast to the other saint there who is depicted, St. Nicholas, who is engrossed in his book. But look how Raphael paints John the Baptist. Look at his feet, look at the cross that he's holding and look at what he's pointing, how he points with his right hand. A few years later, Raphael paints 
this picture. And I wanted to show you these two because these are ex this is an example, this, this sequence between these two is an example of how Raphael's relationship to John the Baptist actually changes in the way he paints him. So in this picture, he's standing in the same place, more or less. We recognize him holding the cross and pointing with his right hand. But look at the head and the whole soul gesture of devotion. This is 1505. In 1508, he paints this Madonna. And I find it quite remarkable how his way of showing John the Baptist has changed. I don't mean for a moment to suggest that he was aware of his previous incarnation, but although he may not have been aware of it, nevertheless, that part of his, of his karma, I think, comes to particular expression then in another way when he paints John the Baptist like this. Look at the wooden cross that he's holding in his left hand, and with his right hand, he points to the celestial vision of Mary and Jesus, but he doesn't have to look at it. The other figures in this picture are kneeling and they have the same gesture of devotion to the, to the vision in heaven of Mary and the child. And they're kneeling and they look up in reverence and devotion. John the Baptist in this picture does not look at the celestial manifestation, but he points to it and he looks out at us. And if you follow, the cross that he's holding in his left hand, can you see where at the bottom it touches the ground? And can you see there, there is the left foot of John. Just enough of it is painted for us to see it. And I find that very interesting. If Raphael had not painted that foot, nobody would say, where are John's feet? It will never arise as a question. So painting just that little bit of the left foot must have some, some meaning. There may be more than one way of understanding this, but I would like to suggest that in this picture, John does not have to look at what he's pointing at because he has made that reality part of his own soul reality. It's not a celestial reality for him only. It's also something that lives so strongly in him that he doesn't have to look at it and can point to it. And the possibility of that objective, internalized relationship to the spiritual world is something that we can begin to achieve here on earth. And that little bit of foot that Raphael paints there, I think attests to this, that it is firmly on the earth that we can begin to develop a relationship to the spiritual world that we can point to, but have so made our own that we don't have to look with the devotion that these other figures here manifest. This is a portrait of Pope Julius II. And he was the Pope who summoned Michelangelo and Raphael to Rome in the beginning of the 16th century to paint in the case of Michelangelo, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, and in the case of Raphael, the Raphael rooms, including the Stanza della Segnatura, which we will be busy with on, on this occasion now. Um, look at his lips. Look at that absolutely controlled will. Um, he, like many of the other popes, led um, what one might consider today to be quite an unsaintly life, in a way. But nevertheless, by papal standards of the time, he was actually quite an exemplary individual. And I feel it's somehow important to recognize him because he was the being, he was the individuality who recognized Raphael and Michelangelo and called them to Rome to to decorate, in the case of Raphael, the rooms that the Pope now wanted to op occupy because he didn't want to um, use the rooms in the floor below, which in a way were a bit grander because they were still so associated with the um, very unholy excesses of uh, the Borgia Popes. So Julius II moves upstairs and asks Raphael 
to decorate the um, stanze where he will work. And I think there are five rooms in all, but we are going to concern ourselves just with one of those rooms. So there are two frescoes um, on the wall of this room. This fresco is on the west wall. And this fresco is on the east wall. And just to give you an idea, this is what the room looks like. I'm sorry with um, Alami all over it, but I couldn't find a better slide. Just to give you a sense, look at the Cosmati mosaic-like decoration on the floor. Here you see the west wall, and also to its left, you see the representation of jurisprudence. Opposite, where the other windows are, you see the representation of Parnassus. And on the east wall is this representation. I'm going to try and discipline myself and not use the terms that these pictures are normally referred to. I mean, I'll say it once because you probably um, are thinking, why doesn't he do that? This is known as the School of Athens, and this one is known as the Disputa. But it's very clear that these names were not given by Raphael. They were given later, and I don't think they add to our understanding of the pictures. Raphael painted these, um, these two frescoes in between 1509 and 1510. And they are the two rooms among the four or five that are in this series that um, I think people recognize as most exclusively painted by Raphael. Of course, he had assistants, but his, his painting is so much part of, of the frescoes in this room especially. Well, it's, it's, not, it's not difficult to understand the way in which these pictures were interpreted. So on this side, you have all the Greek philosophers engaged in their search for the truth. They're engaged in a quest to understand the causes, the reasons for everything in, through philosophy. And in a way, from a traditional point of view, we're expected to think that of course, they were very earnest and very serious, but they couldn't possibly um, they couldn't possibly come to any any clear or comprehensive or complete understanding because all this takes place before the coming of Jesus Christ. And on the opposite wall, sorry. and on the opposite wall, Raphael paints a glorious representation of the Christian revelation that brings not just understanding, but a certain order into the whole experience that we have of our life on earth and also our relationship to the spiritual world. So I think it's, it's very clear, but maybe it should be said that at the top of this picture, you have God the Father holding the globe, and below him you have Christ manifesting the, the wounds of the, of the crucifixion, and to his right, Mary, and then John the Baptist. And then in the next rank of images sitting in the clouds, you have altern alternatively figures from the Old and New Testament who, who occupy their place in heaven um, quite rightfully. Um, I won't identify them all, but the one on the extreme left with the yellow robe is holding a key, so he is Peter, and in the opposite place, in the red robe holding a book, and you can just see he's holding a sword. A sword is the symbol of the martyrdom, and so we identify him as Paul. Just one more that I want to identify. If you, if you look at Peter again, next to him, there's a figure sitting with crossed legs, and this is Adam. And then if we come to the level below, there's the Father God, the Son, and then the dove is a representation of the Holy Spirit. And to the right and left of the, of the, of the dove, 
you see the open books of the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The, um, the slide is not um, clear enough for you to be able to recognize the writing, but it's quite unmistakably there. In each of these books, there are the first words of the Gospels, of the four Gospels, clearly recognizably written. And then below there is an altar, and on the altar is a monstrance, and in the monstrance is the host. The consecrated the sacrament, um, that is the focus of the attention of the people on earth. One or two are looking up, but most of them are relating to the manifestation in the monstrance on the altar. Again, I don't want painstakingly now to identify too many of the individuals here. I'll mention some of their names. The, the, the task I've set myself um, in this session is not really to, um, to guide you through the picture in, in the way that I think most guidebooks or most guides would do, but rather to invite you to come into um, a dynamic where, I'm sorry, where these two pictures are brought into a relationship with each other. And if I manage to do this, then maybe you will understand that the significance of these two pictures does not in any way depend on identifying the individuals who are depicted here. In this picture particularly, many are identifiable in two ways, either historically back to ancient Greece or contemporaneous with Raphael, some of the um, physiognomies there and some of the figures are recognizably people that Raphael wanted to honor who were alive and working in Rome at that time with him. But that's, if you will forgive me, that's not the task that I've set myself for this, for this session. There are plenty of uh, very um, fulsome and comprehensive guides and um, websites where you can identify the names if that's what you're interested in. But I would like to suggest that it's possible to come to an understanding of what lives in this room when we bring these two frescoes into a living relationship with each other through our activity when we stand between them, that that is a way of allowing a deeper meaning to emerge from these pictures than maybe at first um, arises. In that context, I think I also would like to say the following, that at the same time while Raphael was painting these frescoes, Michelangelo was painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And 30 years later, he came back to Rome and painted the altar wall, which interestingly enough is not in the east, but in the west, as it is with St. Um, St. Peter's Basilica. And the normal title, the title under which the altar wall is normally known is the last judgment. And certainly Michelangelo's ecclesiastical patrons were satisfied that in this immense fresco on the altar wall, Michelangelo had um, successfully um, met their expectations of the iconography of a last judgment. They were not completely happy with the style and the way in which he painted um, some aspects of the picture, but they recognized that on this altar wall, there was something that could stand very clearly and unambiguously for the last judgment. But you don't have to look at it for very long with a question that arises out of even the beginnings of an understanding of Michelangelo's biography and his own inner quest for redemption. You don't have to be busy with that picture for very long to realize that actually it isn't a last judgment at all. It's much more a depiction of what Rudolf Steiner calls the Lord of Karma. And this majestic figure of Christ is in the process of bringing about an order in our human evolution to the extent that we cooperate with him in this. It's, uh, it, I think, I find it quite extraordinary, you know, Michelangelo, Raphael, Leonardo, Botticelli, um, Masaccio, Caravaggio, all these great artists of the time, they come out of the super sensible school of Michael. And it's quite extraordinary to see how at one level, what they paint seems to meet the expectations of the Roman, of the Roman church 
in its in its um, understanding of the of the significance of of the life of of Jesus Christ. But it's also quite remarkable to realize that as well as satisfying the expectations of those around them in the church, these artists are showing us a kind of open secret in which um, an esoteric level of understanding becomes immediately visible and accessible if we but look at these pictures with a question that goes beyond the traditional interpretation of the iconography. So I'm saying this about Michelangelo because what I would like to suggest to you on this occasion is that the picture we're looking at is has an esoteric significance that perhaps arises particularly when we compare it with the picture, I'm sorry, I keep doing this, when we compare it with the picture that is opposite. This is clearly the Christian revelation, but it's the Christian revelation as is mediated by the church through the sacraments and at the altar. It will be my task on this occasion to suggest that the deeper esoteric Christian dimension actually is manifested in this picture, although it purports to be a pre-Christian Athenian philosophical um, setting. So if we go to, the, to this picture, where the people on earth are engaged in contemplation, discussion, veneration, devotion to the manifestation on earth, on the altar of the sacrament. And if we look, for example, in this detail, the third figure from the altar on the right is St. Ambrose. It actually says so in the halo. Look at the way he looks up and look at the gesture of his hands. The next bishop is St. Augustine and he is dictating to the scribe. And the next figure it's inscribed in his halo is Thomas, Thomas Aquinas. Then comes a Pope with his glorious tiara. And the next one along with the sort of darker browny purple color robe and hat, this is Buenaventura. And I'm drawing your attention to these because look at the disposition that they manifest. How Buenaventura is actually not looking up and he's not looking at the altar. He's looking for the answer to whatever it is that lives in him as a question at this point. He's looking for the answer in the book. St. Ambrose is looking up. His book is closed. St. Augustine is dictating. And the figure down on the step below who is writing is writing what is being dictated. I think that's all very clear. And if we look at the other side of this picture, we also see different dispositions among the people here on earth to what it is that fills the center of this fresco. The third figure along who is holding the book and looking down, again, his, the halo allows us to identify him. He's um, um, Geronimo. How do you say that in English? Um, I'm sorry, I can't remember the English name for this. And can you see he's, he's holding the book and looking at it? And can you see at his feet there is the lion? Jerome. This is Jerome with the lion at his feet. And look how. Look how he's holding the book. You can see that there's an earnestness in his way of looking at the book that comes out of a conviction that the answer to the question that he is carrying lives in the book. 
He trusts the book. And if you come all the way to the left-hand side of the, of the fresco, you can see a man leaning on the parapet. What are the others saying to him? Look, look at the altar, look at the manifestation of the Christ in the host. And what about the gesture of his left hand? One could almost imagine him saying, yeah, but look at the book. So I would like to suggest that the, just with those few examples, and one could go through, through many more, but I would like to suggest that the predominant gesture among the people on earth in this picture is of recognizing that the, the source of their, of their devotion, the source of their relationship to all these events is something that lies outside them, either in heaven or on the altar or in the books. And if we now look at the fresco on the opposite wall, on the east wall, again, we see somebody writing and somebody reading. Look at the energy with which this fellow is writing. He and Adam are the only two figures that are cross-legged that I can find in the all, all the works of Raphael, unless you include the Jesus child in the, in the Sistine Madonna. But look at the energy with which this guy is writing. Look how his hair is blown. There is such an extraordinary intensity. And the contrast is beautiful because look at the fellow to his left on our right. Look how he looks down. The contrast in these two is, is so powerful. The one is urgently and intensely busy with writing something and the other reserves the right to make a judgment about it in good time for himself. There's such a quality of, I'll decide for myself whether or not what you're writing is as important as it seems to be for you. And that quality of attending is even more, I think, intense in this figure in the blue robe who is lying on the steps. Remember how Ambrose, um, remember how the figures in the other fresco were reading. They were reading with the certainty that the answers to their questions would lie in the, in the text that they were reading. St. Jerome particularly. And look here how this figure holds the paper more or less at arm's length and the whole way in which he's sitting, I think speaks very clearly of Yes, I will, I will read this, but I will decide for myself if what I find here is true. And on the other side of this fresco on the east wall, we also see writing and reading. Look at the the large figure sitting with his foot on the little block with the white lower garment and the red upper garment, it's clear that he is writing something that arises out of his own, out of his own soul spirit. The source of what he is writing is within him. He's not being told what to write. And it's quite true that there may be two or three people behind him who are looking, who are looking at what he is writing and their gesture really, in a way, seems to belong to gestures that I tried to identify on the other side, on the other picture. And you have then the figure with boots sitting on the, on the stone, leaning on this other block. He seems to have paused in his writing and he's engaged in some kind of inner contemplation. And you can also feel that the source of what he is contemplating and the whole process that he's engaged in is one that has an inner self-referential grounding in itself. He's...
So one of the one of the aspects that becomes um, unmistakably clear in this picture is that so much of the activity arises out of the individual's own initiative and is not in response to something that happens outside. There isn't the same reverence or recognition of something beyond. So many of the figures in this picture have awoken to the to their inner sense of to their inner sense as a source for that which which for that which they're engaged in. And when when one reaches that that level of uh, recognizing the sovereignty of one's thinking or the possibility of, of creative thought, I ask the question: What is the most human thing that you can do? with that awakened sovereignty of your, of your inner creative being? What is the most human thing that you can do with that? And I would like to suggest that it is to engage in dialogue with another human being that has also awoken to that inner source of sovereignty for their creative inner activity. You remember the line of the snake from um, Goethe's fairy tale. Um, very often the idiom has it that um, speech is silver and silence is golden. And the snake actually puts it the other way around and says that, and the German word is Gespräch is golden. And it's not speech. It's, I think the word Gespräch is much closer to a conversation. A, um, a speaking with another person. It's not speech, it's, it has the quality of a conversation. And on the other wall, there is in the center of the picture at the level of the earth, there is the symbol of communion as it is granted through the church, through the ecclesia. And in the center of this picture on earth, we have two human beings engaged in a dialogue. Um, sometimes it's worth pointing out that dialogue doesn't mean two, that would be duologue. Dialogue means through the logos. So they're not, they're not sharing a, a, an experience at the level of their feeling. They're engaging in a sharing through the logos, through words, and they're having, they're having a conversation. And if you just look at this part of, the, of these two figures, look at the gestures of the hands, the right hands in both cases, have you got enough information in the top half of the picture to be able to say which one of them is standing still and which one of them is walking forward. Is there enough information in the upper part of their bodies to answer that question? So if you were looking at the color and the red coming forward and the blue perhaps receding a little, you, you may have uh, realized that the older man is walking forward and the younger man is standing still. But I think many people see the gestures as, as guiding the answer to that question. And the raised hand of the old man suggests something, um, something, something fixed, something stationary. And yet it is precisely his feet that show him to be walking. And that the right hand of the younger man in the blue row, some see that as pointing down to the earth, but it, you can also see it as pointing forward. And that might have led you to suppose that he's the one who's walking forward. But on the other hand, you see his feet are still. And I'm making much of this point because it's not just that these two are in dialogue, in conversation. The way in which the hand gestures of one correspond with the feet gestures of the other and vice versa, I think is part of Raphael's genius of showing that such a conversation involves a kind of interdependence. The listening of the one is the ground on which the other can speak. 
And so I think what Raphael has shown here in, this, in these two figures is not just that they're talking, but that the communion between them is a mutually sustained activity. This vertical axis is so beautiful. It really represents something of the um, of the Trinity in a in a very in a very in a very beautiful way. I'm interested particularly in the way in which Raphael has painted the monstrance on the altar. Look, the horizon is immediately below the base of the monstrance. And in a much earlier picture, which is in London, um, something of the same effect is achieved by placing the cross in this crucifixion by Raphael very firmly into the earth. But look how the figure on the cross is wholly above the horizon. And mindful of what I said about the way in which Raphael changes how he paints John the Baptist, look at the four figures here, the kneeling figures of Jerome and Mary Magdalene. We don't see their feet, they're below the horizon and they're looking up with devotion. But the two standing figures, Mary the mother of Jesus and John, Lazarus John the divine, look, they don't look up at the event of the crucifixion, they look out at us and we see their feet firmly on the ground. And as if to emphasize the way in which this event is an inner experience for them, we see that their heads are both partly above the horizon. Now, Raphael did not sign all his pictures, but when he signed a picture, he chose a place to leave the mark of his individuality that was intimately connected with the meaning of the picture. And if you're familiar with medieval and early Renaissance iconography of the crucifixion, you will not be surprised to see these angels catching the blood that flows from the wounds of the hands and the side. And then you would expect that the blood that flows from the wounds of the feet would make its way down the cross and be shown to enter the earth because it was well understood that this blood entering the earth is the beginning of a transformative, transubstantive process for the whole earth. And if you look for that blood at the base of the cross, you do not find it. But what you find is that Raphael has left the mark of his individuality here, exactly where you would expect to see the redeeming blood flowing down into the earth. Now that's quite remarkable for many reasons. I think it's quite remarkable because you wouldn't see it unless you look for it or unless someone points it out or unless you happen to be so close. And it's quite remarkable in another respect that I think is quite obvious in the context of, of an anthroposophical approach to all this art. Rudolf Steiner describes the, the blood as the, the organ of the ego. And Raphael attests to his own I am precisely here where your eyes might guide you to expect to see the instrument, the organ of the redeeming blood. He places his name here. But there's another interesting detail in this in this altar. Can you see the magnificent knot pattern in the, in the drape in the front of the altar? And can you just make out the name of Julius, which is included there, Julius II, the Pope? Can you see IV, 
L-I-U-S. Can you see these six letters in the center part of the three, three sections of the, of the drapery in front of the altar? I want to go on um, for a moment, if I may, with the, the significance of where Raphael signs his name. So the picture on the left was painted by Perugino, Raphael's teacher, and the picture on the right was painted by Raphael. So you see the iconography is immediately recognizable and in many ways so similar, and yet you can see that what Raphael does is to, is to live in the imagination of his teacher, but take it to another level through his own way of approaching um, the theme. The, the theme of this picture is the betrothal of the Virgin. And you see Mary in Raphael's picture, you see Mary on the left and Joseph on the right, and you see the priest that is joining them together. There's much to say about this picture. I mean, the absolute symmetry of the temple building is in such wonderful contrast to the spontaneous living mobile movement among the, the people in the front. And I love the way the priest in his movement enters in completely to the dynamic of the people, but yet in his garb and in his beard, he shows us the symmetry that belongs to the temple. Raphael signed this picture. And again, it's not conventionally in the bottom right-hand corner, but can you see here on this image that he signs his name right at the, in the middle of the temple. And again, it's unobtrusive. It doesn't shout at you. Um, it's not hubris, it's not arrogance. You, most people miss it. You see that if you see just the picture, it wouldn't occur to you to look for the name of the artist there. But this is precisely where Raphael leaves the mark of his individuality, because this temple is a representation of maybe at least two things. It's a representation of the, the human body in its perfect form before the fall, and it's also, if we look at the whole picture, it's a representation of, of how the human being may find a new relationship to the divine form through the redemptive possibility that is given by the child that will be born to this woman and this man. So you could see the temple as being a memory of what the human being was before the fall, or a vision of what the human being may become if we manage to reach that on Vulcan through the redemptive forces that will be brought to earth through the child that will be born of this marriage. What I find so remarkable is that the temple door is open and the horizon again is there so that Although the temple is firm, firmly on earth, the temple invites us to recognize there's something beyond. There's another element in this picture that I find very, very compelling. Look on the left, can you see somebody is rushing in? And look on the right, can you see somebody else is rushing out? The whole way in which Raphael has painted the, the people here is one of activity, of movement. Everything is in a process of becoming. Sorry, I beg your pardon, this is not. In, in this picture, everything is in a process of becoming and there's such a, there's such a sense of time and um, unfinished business. Whereas in the picture on the opposite wall, 
everything has a kind of order that is almost timeless. There is a, a, a beautiful given paradigm, but here everything needs to be achieved. But there's another dimension to this picture. If we look at the at this left side of the of the fresco, I'm interested in these three stone blocks. The smaller one is what the, the man writing is resting his foot on. The, the middle one is slightly larger, and the man who's pointing to something in the book is resting on that. And the third bigger block provides something that this person who's writing can for a moment pause and lean on. These blocks are square, they're quadrilateral, they're cubes, more or less. And I think these blocks remind us that it is in the nature of our experience of being on earth that we meet on earth something that offers us a kind of resistance. It offers us opposition. And I think we can recognize simply from all biology that when something that is in a process of growth encounters opposition, it either dies or becomes strong enough to overcome the opposition. And I'm interested that these three blocks on this side of the, of the painting provide the support, but also the resistance against which the activities that are taking place can unfold. Against the resistance of these blocks, whatever is happening, can unfold. And on the other side of the picture, quite remarkably, we find, I think, um, the complement to this. Can you see the figure in white with a sort of red hat who's holding the, a celestial globe, the globe of the stars? And the figure in front of him with a beautiful yellow robe is holding the terrestrial globe. He's holding the globe that represents the earth. And there is a third globe in this part of the picture. We have the cosmos, we have the earth, and then look at the beautiful round, mainly bald head of the man who's doing geometry. I love the way in which there is a contraction through these globes, through these spheres. There is the cosmic celestial sphere, then there is the sphere of the earth, and then comes the sphere of the human head that is able to cognize and make sense of and measure the earth. He's engaged in geometry, measuring the earth. I'm so reminded of the lectures that Rudolf Steiner gave at Christmas 1921, where he describes the metamorphosis that must take place between the capacity that the shepherds and the capacity that the Magi bring. And the Magi had the capacity of looking up into the stars and understanding what, was, what they needed to know their capacity to look out and read the stars was what gave them their, their impulse to come to Bethlehem, as well as what guided them in whatever they did. And do you remember how in those lectures, Rudolf Steiner describes how that capacity incarnates, concentrates, contracts into the capacity to do mathematics, into the capacity to move thoughts within the consciousness that corresponds to the way the celestial objects, the stars and the planets move in the cosmos. So I find the celestial globe, the terrestrial globe, and then the cranium in which the activity of the stars can be experienced in a way that is reflected through the human thinking activity and can become an objective experience of geometry. And again, look how his leg is so firmly planted on the earth. 
but this, this roundness, these globes, these spheres that contrast so beautifully with the blocks on the other side of the picture are also accompanied by the movements and the dynamics of these four young people. Look how their gestures of their hands, the disposition of their heads, and also which direction they're looking at. Look how the dynamic between these four becomes also a cascade that follows this celestial, terrestrial, cerebral cognizing of the earth. It's perhaps not irrelevant to remember that at the same time as Raphael was painting this picture, Copernicus was busy with the treaties that was only published after his death, in which he proposes that it is possible to imagine not a geocentric picture of the universe, but actually a heliocentric picture of the universe. Raphael also signs this picture. And again, it's not conveniently in the bottom right-hand corner. Can you see at the top of the picture, there is a man with a stick, a green mantle and a white hat. Um, some people say he must be blind, I don't know. But if you follow the line of the stick, it, we don't see the end of it, but if you extend the line of the stick, it then goes through the celestial globe, through the head of the man doing the geometry, and comes right down to the point of his geometry, of, of the geometry that he is doing. And this reproduction is not sufficiently clear, but you can see there is a yellow collar hem at his neck. And Raphael signed his name just there with four letters, R, V, S, M. Raphael of Urbino, his hand. And since this fresco in Rome has been cleaned, those four letters have been removed. But interestingly enough, at this exhibition in London that I began by speaking about, there is a huge, almost life-size reproduction of the whole of this fresco of these Greek philosophers. And the photograph was taken before the cleaning, and you can see quite unmistakably there on the collar hem of this geometry, the four letters. And so here again, we are faced with the, the challenge to understand why would Raphael put the, the mark of his individuality in connection with this figure? And you may also know that the second figure along, the first one has a white garment and a white hat. The second one looking out at us has a black cap. This is another self-portrait of Raphael's. So here we have what appears to be the the Christian revelation, which is the answer to the pagan search for the truth. And I've already mentioned that, although that's the normal way of understanding the relationship between these two frescoes, I think it becomes, um, it becomes more interesting when we bring them into a dialogue together and realize that the communion that is shown on the West Wall is something that is experienced as given by the priest, by the church. And in the center of this picture, we experience that the communion arises through the free sovereign activity between two or more individuals. The Trinity in the picture opposite on the West Wall is unmistakably depicted as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as the dove. I want to suggest that the Trinity also 
is shown in this picture, but in not such an expected way. If we look at the architecture, we can see that this is given, this is unchanging, this is something that we experience as, as given. It's the wrought work of man. It's not what Rudolf Zanner calls the wrought work of the gods in the Michael letters. Here it's really what human beings have done. It's the ground on which, it's the space in which the human beings can then engage in their unfinished activity of becoming. And if you follow that paradigm, then something of the architecture represents the given in the same sense that the wrought works of the gods can be understood to be a representation of the realm of the father god. But the human beings here are engaged in such a mobile, moving and dynamic process that we can recognize the becoming here, the search, the unfinished yearning and searching for the answers to whatever the questions are that arise in this individualized self-consciousness shared then with others. So I would like to suggest that the movement of the people here strongly evokes that which lives in time, the becoming. But there are then four figures in this picture that actually look out at us. I don't know whether if I use my cursor, I didn't think of this before, I'm sorry. Can you see here there is a baby? And here there is a child. And here there is a youth maybe. And, and these three figures look out at us as indeed does Raphael over here. And these three beings looking out at us, the child, the baby maybe, the child, and then the youth, and then the artist himself. I sense in the way they look out at us that they're asking us a question. What do you make of this? How can you become involved in these, in these pictures? One of the characteristics of Renaissance art is that it is unfinished. And I don't mean, I'm not referring now to the um, unfinished paintings by Raphael, his last one, or the unfinished sculptures by Michelangelo. I'm making a fairly general um, statement that the nature of the great work of the Renaissance is unfinished in the sense that even though the artist may have completed what they intended to do, it actually only begins to reveal its, its fuller potential, its greater depths, when the person standing in front of this art is not merely a beholder, but is, in, but is able to engage actively with the work of art so that we can really say the, the one who stands in front and looks becomes co-creative with what the artist has finished. And I find this is true of uh, Michelangelo's last, um, Leonardo's Last Supper particularly. It's true of so many of the works of Michelangelo, particularly the Sistine Chapel and the Medici Chapel, so many of the sculptures. And I think with Raphael, it's no more true than in this room itself. Because when we allow, they're frescoes, they're painted on the wall, they're part of the architecture. And you can't naturally hang them next to each other. In order to engage in some kind of comparison between the pictures, you have to stand between them, look at one and carry the other with your inner eye. And then you have physically to turn and look at the other one and remember what you saw in the first one. So that if you wish to engage in some kind of, uh, if you want to bring these pictures into a dialogue, if you want to find the way of comparing them, allowing them to illuminate each other, you can't just look at them. You have actually physically to move and turn your head as well as then in your inner activity to bring them into a relationship with each other through what you do. Of course, it's possible today 
to show them next to each other as reproductions. Um, and sometimes lecturers do that because the, the, the frescoes invite that sort of comparison. But when you actually put them next to each other, my experience is it, it feels very odd. The whole way in which they're painted and the place in which they're painted is an unequivocal invitation to be active by turning from one to the other and allowing what arises within you to, um, to begin to be the fruit of your own activity in understanding what comes to expression through Raphael's work in this room. So, I know I have tried to characterize the Trinity in this, in this picture, and the Trinity arises unmistakably in the vertical central axis on this picture. But I'd like now to, to bring this to a conclusion in connection with, with the Whitson Festival that we celebrate today. There is an order in this picture. God the Father has a kind of supreme position here. It is as if everything is under his, his loving care, that it be so. It's also painted in, in the open air. We see nature on the left. On the right, we see a block of stone, which is probably to evoke the the understanding that this was painted at the time when the St. Peter's Basilica was being rebuilt. And the means by which communion can be achieved here is something that is given. And the quality of this fresco for me is very much that which has been given and which we can be grateful for and reverent towards. And therefore, I would like to suggest that this picture actually evokes the mood of the father. The communion at the center of this picture is not given, it is being created. And if we look at the activities that these several figures are all engaged in, either on their own or with others, we find, as, as we've already said, there's, there's such a, um, a dynamic of activity and un, unfinished searching. I feel the element of time lives as strongly in this fresco as the quality of space lives in the one opposite. And so to me, this, this fresco evokes the reverence that belongs to the sun. So if these frescoes opposite each other allow us to have the feeling for the father on the west wall and here on the east wall of the sun, then you can say, where is the, where is the Holy Spirit in this experience that makes the Trinity? And maybe it's already become very clear from the way in which I've been trying to describe this that the capacity of, a, of an individual to stand between these two pictures and bring them into a dialogue that reveals the connection between them, the capacity to do that, I would like to suggest, is given by the grace of the Holy Spirit. So that precisely in this room, in the active, not beholding, but engagement with these pictures, the third element of the Trinity arises not through what is painted, but through what someone may do as they stand there between the pictures, bringing them to life out of that inner creative genius that in a way we could say these frescoes are waiting for. I wanted to end with a very different picture. Many of you will know Ninetta Sombart. 
She was born in 1925 and died in 2019. She lived in Dornach in the last years of her life and many of her works are well known among the, um, among the Christian community communities because um, her paintings have been used in, on many occasions as altar paintings. This is her invitation to contemplate the Whitson, the Pentecost experience. And I find it quite remarkable. The conventional iconography for Whitson is to see the 12 disciples now become apostles with halos and little flames on their foreheads, um, sitting in a room together, receiving this grace of the Holy Spirit. But um, Ninetta Sombart has decided to paint this in another way. And I'm sure there's more than one way of understanding this particular way of showing it. But as a conclusion, I would like to share what has become um, my way of looking at this picture and engaging with it. It's quite clear from the way in which she paints it that the disciples here are not just standing, they seem to be pressing forward in such a way that their, that their attention and their heads, the heads are almost, almost the same color, the garments are different colors. They're pressing forward and leaning in leaning in in a way that suggests what it what is it that they're concentrating on. There is an absolute togetherness here, a shared union of wishing to discover or understand. And the intensity of that concentrated leaning in, I would like to say, the intensity of that evokes in me the next step so clearly that this is the last time the 12 will be together, at least in that physical configuration on earth. After this moment of Whitson, they will go out individually and do their apostolic tasks. They will be apostles after this moment. They will go out into the world individually or in small groups. And the 12 foldness that was so important for them here on earth, so important indeed, that between Ascension and Whitson, they felt the need to elect a 12th disciple to fill the, the place made vacant by Judas committing suicide. So the recognition of this, of this paradigm of 12 lived so strongly in them. And I think that's what Ninetta paints here the full complement of the, the, the zodiacal company, the 12, are together here. And the, the energy with which they lean in evokes in me the, the next step, the release, where they will then breathe, breathe out, they will become a company whose union, whose togetherness does not depend on being together on earth in that configuration of 12, as they have been for the last three years and 50 days. Their togetherness now will be in their individual different ways of going out into the world, not as disciples now, but as apostles. And that for me is such a powerful expression of the difference between the old community and the new community. The old community had a union, it had a unity. And what makes the new communion is the recognition and the acceptance and the inclusion of the differences of those who come together for a single purpose. Good, thank you for your attention. I have no idea how many people are there and, what, and whether what's happening, but um, Andre, maybe we should. Yeah, Andrew, thank you very much for leading us to the celebration of Witsen this evening. And uh, uh, first of all, can I ask you how you feel? Can we move into 
question and answer. Yes, session. indeed. So shall I say stop share now? Yes, please. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, dear friends, please uh, note it's uh, 10 minutes after midnight in London. So uh, let's keep it in mind. So because no, it's fine. If people, have, if people have things that they would like to add or... or well, it's it's my responsibility just, you know, just uh, make it conscious. Okay, uh, yes. And uh, there is, you know, in the bottom where you scream, it's uh, button uh, reactions click on it and uh, there's a big button raise a hand. Yes, and if you have statement or question to our dear Andrew, uh, please click on it and uh, we will hear from you. Yeah, you can start, don't be shy. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, David, I can. Uh, the, you know, the last statement that you just said was, I think, is one of the most important things I've heard in a long time. <laughs> hmm. Being able to, to make a, a, a consensus out of difference, I think, is so important. The whole idea of communion, the, our, our, we have such a lack of ability of being able to understand differences. When we see differences as a difficulty, or we see differences as dangerous or conflict or all these words and I, I, it's just it drives me crazy when i think about it because what I, I don't need more of me i don't need more people like me i need people who are different i need to be able to get better at getting those differences together and one of the things that i love about steiner and the foundation stone the whole the whole concept to me is that it's about bringing those differences together the foundation stone has 12 faces on it they represent the 12 apostles. The 12 apostles represent 12 different points of view. We need to be able to find ways to bring people together, not with just consensus, but to actually celebrate the difference. So, oh, oh Eugene, you have such a different opinion. What can you tell me about it? We need to lean in. We need to get to understand how we can connect with each other. And, and it's the only way we're gonna be able to see beyond all of the bias and the difficulties. So I just wanted to, my, my only statement is I wanted to say thank you very much. Thank you. Your final statement, if you can remember it or, or, or you wrote it down, I would. I, I think it should be our, our one of our missions, one of our watchwords for what we're doing and why. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dave. It's, it's, it's lovely to hear you um, reflecting back the way you heard that, because you, you say it exactly as I as I see it. Um, I think the the disciples had to have a unity that yes. the apostles then become become responsible for going out into the world in their different ways and mm -hmm. developing in their differences. But of course, they are united in something that doesn't make them all the same. They are right. united in a purpose that allows them to celebrate that and pursue it with the differences that belong to each of them. Yeah, yeah. Rather than getting rid of the differences, I want to encourage the difference. I want to, I want to get, you get to a place where if somebody's different, it's like, oh, great, you a different idea. Oh, fantastic. Tell me more. Tell me more. Thank it's you, Dave. So we... yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Richard? Yes. Uh, again, Charlene asked the name of the artist who did that last painting. Ninetta Zombart. Yes. How? S-O-M. Yes. B A R T. S O M B A R T. Thank you. If you Google her, you find a short biography, and um, almost all her pictures and the images are there. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Christina Sophia. Yeah, could you ask your question, please? Oh, thank you very much. Wonderful, wonderful, Andrew. My question is, when you showed the picture of Raphael uh, painting of the temple with, um, with his teachers painting of the temple side by side, it looked to me as if the one on the, what was our left, my left, had the older Joseph and the young Mary and perhaps that was an image of the teacher painting the 
the uh, Matthew Gospel, Mary and Joseph, and the one on the on the right that Raphael painted looked more like the young Joseph and the young Mary the carpenter looked more like perhaps of the Luke Jesus and of course that was the the bearer the Nathan soul so I'm just just want to put that out there thank you no I, I think you're you've seen that absolutely correctly thank you so much Christina thank you thank you so much more questions dear friends or statements. Okay, Joan. Yeah, please unmute your computer. Joan. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, you, for the lecture. Uh -huh. um, there is just one comment that has always, in some ways, intrigued me, and is the um, reference in the gospel to the. Uh, tongues of fire it doesn't refer to flames when the when the uh, actual uh holy spirit descends on the apostles he says it's a tongue of fire which refers to this kind of a speech and the uh, uh conversation dialogue interaction yes it's just yes. Yeah, I mean, it's always painted as little flames. It says like tongues of flame. I think it says like tongues of flame in the in the in, in the in the in the chapter. I'm, I'm not sure exactly of the words now, but this this flame. Um, um, we were busy with this theme earlier today in another context, and uh, Patrick Dixon put it very beautifully: the flame that arises on the on the head of the disciple comes down into the heart as a as enthusiasm and then goes right down as 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 will into the the, the burning will forces to 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 be active and make change in in the earth on the earth i, I found that very beautiful mm. so from the head to the heart into the will thank you maria nice to see you nice to see you too andrew thank you yeah. So, Joan Tenheimer. Thank you. Joanne, go ahead. Yes, thank you. I, I appreciated this talk very much. So, I just wanted to express my gratitude and also, especially because next Friday I will be at the National Gallery. And I feel like I got a very important preview that will help me enjoy it even more. <laughs> I Joanne, wonder, have you got a have you got a ticket already? I do, yes. Yes, that's um, important. Yes. Yes, good. yes. I'm looking forward to it. And I wondered, are both the um, the west wall and east wall viewable there, or is it just the east? No, wall? it's only the east wall. I mean, they've they've got a an, an almost life size reproduction of the east wall, and uh, it's such a pity that the that the west wall is not there as well. But I mean, that's how it is. I mean, I think it's interesting, you know, I think on the whole, art historians recognize that the, the East Wall is an altogether more interesting painting. Um, it doesn't always please the ecclesiastics to, to have that said, but it's, there's much more going on that is of engageable interest. But I, I mean, so I can understand why that's the one that they um, chose to put there. But I, I really don't feel one can one can prioritize them in that sense. I think the important thing is to recognize that they re begin to reveal something beyond the immediately obvious iconography when you bring them into a dialogue through the activity you engage in. And uh, yeah, and he's so putting take, take a take a reproduction, a small reproduction of the. Of the of the west wall with you so that when you stand there you can make the comparison good idea yes yes thank you so much thank you john your friends who is next mm -hmm. maria we cannot hear you
Well, uh, maybe it's time to say thank you again to Andrew, dear Andrew. Happy Witsen. Thank you. And thank you so much for joining us as, as usual. Well, yeah, thank, thank, you. thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to, to share Absolutely. these thoughts. Absolutely. Yeah, dear friend, please feel free to unmute your mics. Oh, you know what? Um, let me uh, do some a little announcement because our next uh, presentation is quite special. So I, I know it's, uh, I, I can see Andrew Linnell is here and uh, I. <laughs> so our next presentation will be done in two languages. So it's done for our Russian speaking community in US, but also for our friends in Moscow, St. Petersburg, Ukraine for all people who understand Russian language. So I, I'll, be, I'll be interpreter. So Andrew, I mean, if you have one minute or can you give a little announcement uh, and title of lecture, uh, Transhumanism in the Light of Anthroposophy. Andrew? Well, that's the title. Um, thank you, Andre. And, and I'm looking forward to this. Um, <clears throat> speaking to uh, a crowd that speaks Russian, as you, you know, my wife is Russian from Ukraine, but she's a Russian um, <laughs> in her heritage. So it's, you know, it, it's quite interesting um, to go through what she's experiencing with this. This talk takes up a theme that uh, is key to things that Steiner had to say about the future and what we have to uh, accomplish um, in our time to prepare for that future. So it's, um, <laughs> he does talk about the welding together of mankind and the machine and the bringing about of the interpenetration of the moral and the mechanical. So these are very difficult topics, very challenging ones. I wish you well for the talk, Andrew. Thank you. I might get, I might get, no, and I won't say it. Not much. <laughs> yeah, please join us, uh, dear friends. I mean, it's convenient time. It's 10, 10 a.m. Uh, at Central Time in the U.S. Right. Yeah, so again, uh, dear Andrew Wolper, thank you so much. And dear friends, uh, please feel free to unmute yourself and say hi and, you know, greetings to Andrew and to each other. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Many blessings. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you so much. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Good night, Andre. Yeah, good night, friends. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Much of love. <laughs> Goodbye.